so much for uh, inviting me here to talk to you today about the three P's of my life, polio, post-polio syndrome, and polio plus, and what the current coronavirus pandemic has in common with uh, the you know, pre-soft vaccine days. I'm gonna share my screen with you and um, go from there. Um, I wanna point out at the very beginning that um, I'll do so talking about some negative things in my personal life with polio. I do so representing more than 2 million polio survivors here in North America and more than 20 million polio survivors worldwide. And that life is good and no matter what the future holds for me physically, I truly am one of the lucky ones. Polio was one of the most feared infectious diseases in the 20th century. Polio is a virus that attacks the nerves that control your muscles. If we were back in the 1950s, before the SOC vaccine was discovered, and we were gathered together, uh, you know, in, in real life, uh, if one of you was contagious with polio virus, just by shaking hands or hugging, many would have come down with polio. And when you went home, you would have passed it on to your friends and family. That's how contagious polio is. However, polio is not just a modern day disease. Hieroglyphics found in Egypt around 1500 BC, more than 3,500 years ago, shows a polio victim with, on crutches with one leg smaller than the other. So we fast forward to the summer of 1953, where hospital polio wards with dreaded iron lungs, the picture on the left, uh, these help polio victims breathe. And what's ironic is that yesterday's iron lungs are today's ventilators. Here we have a bank of iron lungs, polio victims stacked on top of each other. Here's a baby only a few months old in an iron lung. If one of the members came down with uh, polio, many times whole families were quarantined. So the iron lung is not the only thing in the 50s have in common with today's shelter in place orders, in fact, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The scientists actually knew less about polio back in the 50s than today's scientists know about the coronavirus. Like COVID-19, they did not know why some that caught polio had mild symptoms and others so severe that they died or had extreme outcomes. In the case of polio, paralyzed limbs and breathing issues. Like COVID-19, people were contagious before they had symptoms, thus unknowingly infecting others. In fact, they now know that for every diagnosis of paralytic polio, there were as many as 200 people walking around with little or no symptoms uh, and you know, very contagious and uh, infecting other people. Another similarity between COVID-19 and polio is that they both target specific but different age groups. COVID-19, especially lethal for elderly who have existing health issues, polio for the young. To this day, they don't know why the young with polio. And I suspect because the younger children uh, put things in their mouth and uh, that's, how, that's how polio is spread is through, through the mouth. Like today's pandemic in the 1950s before the SOC vaccine, people were frightened. It was a scary time because catching polio was as easy as catching a cold. So a strange thing was happening, or should I say not happening in 50, 1953, summer rituals. Public swimming pools were closed, little league fields in many towns were empty. And just like today, mothers didn't have their kids with them while they were grocery shopping. I often hear from polio su survivors stories on how they felt abandoned when they were in the hospital polio wards because like today's coronavirus patients, they weren't allowed to have visitors. They would go weeks without seeing their parents. And when they did, it was from a far distance, usually behind a glass window. This is me, and this is where everyone says, ah, and you know, when we're live here, uh, this is me just before I started to walk. What's interesting in this photo is what's missing. My, my mom refused to have my leg braces photographed. I, fear, I suspect for fear that people would ostracize me or my family because I had polio. I was paralyzed from my neck down at age 10 months old, only six months before the SOC vaccine was widely distributed. Because my mom did Sister Kinney's physical therapy on me, Sister Kinney was a nurse from Australia that developed the physical therapy program for 
paralyzed polio victims so that they would uh, exercise all their muscles so their muscles didn't uh, atrophy. Because my mom did this physical therapy on me, I walked a year later. In fact, my brother takes credit for teaching me how to walk. He would take the example of my parents and, and lean me up against the refrigerator and encourage me to walk. But unlike my parents, when I started to fall, he didn't catch me. So eventually, out of self-defense, I finally put my foot out to stop myself from falling. Thus, my first steps. And to this day, he takes credit for teaching me how to walk. Um, as years went by, I got to the point where most people would never have guessed I had had polio. My mom did a tremendous job in per, per, um, protecting my muscles while I was paralyzed. Uh, I had a fairly normal childhood, and I actually played baseball, basketball, and football in high school. However, my coaches didn't know that I had polio. I didn't know polio, ha having uh, recovered so well, I didn't know it would affect me. Uh, but my coaches always yelled at me and often called me lazy because I was slow, uh, not coordinated. Uh, it was a very frustrating time in my life. That was polio for a lot of people. I was one of the lucky ones. Many young adults and children died or grew up paralyzed or had an arm or leg that was significantly smaller because their muscles atrophied. I have many friends that got polio when they were older. I was blessed because I don't remember having polio. My mom would tell me how I would scream in pain when she stretched my muscles while I was paralyzed. For those who were older when they got polio, they remember all too well the pain and how they suffered many times with multiple corrective, uh, painful corrective surgeries. One friend of mine even had a good leg uh, shortened five inches to match their polio leg so they could walk without a significant limp. When I turned 40, I started to have renewed muscle weakness, joint pain, and extreme fatigue. Eventually, because many doctors had never seen polio uh, victims back in 1992. Uh, after seeing 10 different doctors in two years, I was finally diagnosed with post-polio syndrome. Many never get that diagnosis of post-polio syndrome and suffer without knowing why. 15 years later, I'm confined to a wheelchair for most of my mobility. For every child we save from polio, if they survive the initial polio virus attack, we truly are saving them from a life of pain and suffering. Post-polio syndrome. The more a polio survivor overuses their muscles, the faster their muscles die off. For somebody like me who had almost every muscle from my neck down affected, just the hard work of trying to get to normal over the years took a negative toll on my muscles. The neurologist told me that if I didn't want to lose the total use of my legs again, I had to make dramatic changes in my life. The old adage of use it or lose it had to be replaced with conserve to preserve. But like most polio survivors being an A-type personality, it was very hard for me to slow down. A prime example of that is uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, back uh, in his day, to his first term, he was walking around uh, in crutches. Uh, he spent a lot of time in Warm Springs, Georgia. Uh, they didn't know about post-polio syndrome. And the logical thing is if you have weakened, uh, weak muscles, let's build those muscles up. So they put him such, through such a tremendous uh, physical therapy program, they act, actually destroyed his muscles. His, his last term of presidency, just before he passed away, they had to carry him and pre-position him into place. He could not uh, even stand. Um, so um, the, what's on the screen now is basically some of the symptoms that uh, post-polio syndrome uh, survivor, polio survivors have. Um, these symptoms occur about 30 to 40 years after the original polio virus attack, and as many as 70% of those paralyzed by polio. To avoid overuse, I restrict my steps to a couple hundred steps a day. Many days each step is very painful, but I've learned that there's very little I can't do. I just have to find a different way of doing it. I'm lucky I live in a world where there are organizations like Rotary International and with Rotarians like yourself who care about the welfare of others and who put service above self. April 12th of this past year was the 65th anniversary of Jonas Salk announcing to the world the success of the initial human tests to a national radio audience, opening the way to mass distribution of the Salk vaccine. 
President Eisenhower declared Salk and his team of scientists national heroes, and there were great celebrations worldwide. Then Salk refused to patent the vaccine. Yet it's estimated that he turned down the opportunity to personally earn billions of dollars by literally giving away the vaccine to the world. Salk often said, our greatest responsibility is to be good ancestors. I submit to you that J Dr. Jonas Salk will go down in history as a great ancestor. So count your blessings. Uh, I'm assuming that a large percentage of you uh, have received your uh, childhood vaccinations and protecting you from these uh, many childhood diseases like measles and mumps and, um, you know, uh, all these different things, including polio. There are some people who cannot be vaccinated due to medical reasons or they have a compromised immune system because of uh, like a cancer patient who's going through uh, chemo. That's why it's important to have the majority of the people around that person be vaccinated, thus cause, uh, creating what's called the herd immunity. This past year, because we have areas of the United States with lower vaccination rates than India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria, there were over 1,300 cases of measles in the U.S. from one case that came from outside of the United States. To control measles, 93 to 95% of the population needs to be vaccinated to create this herd immunity. One lady, uh, because due to her cancer treatments, uh, she was sick, so she went to the doctors. Unfortunately, she sat next to somebody who was contagious with measles. She died. If it was a newborn baby who can't be vaccinated against measles um, until they're 12 months old, that newborn would have, would have died. Thousands, of di thousands died in Europe and Asia this year from measles. So for polio, you need at least 85% of the population vaccinated to create the needed herd immunity to protect those that can't be vaccinated or have uh, immune compromised systems. Unfortunately, every 60 seconds, a child dies from a preventable disease. 1,500 kids die every day in the world from vaccine preventable diseases. And according to Bill Gates, for every dollar spent on childhood immunizations, you get $44 in economic benefits. That's a reduction of treating the patient while they're uh, ill and their whole life, and also the productivity that uh, they will have throughout their lifetime um, because they did not get a childhood uh, disease. So as you know, in 1985, Reuter got involved with, started Polio Plus. Back then, there were over a thousand cases a day. Um, it really was incredible. Uh, by then, the United States and the um, Western Hemisphere was actually uh, eradicated. But even, even then, in the developing countries other than the uh, Western Hemisphere, there were a thousand cases a day. There have been 54 cases of wild polio this so far this year, 11 in Afghanistan and 43 in Pakistan. Uh, Nigeria has been polio free for almost four years and will shortly be uh, declared uh, polio uh, eradicated and all of, uh, you know, all of Africa will be declared uh, polio free, wild polio free. With the help of Rotary and its world partners, we have vaccinated more than 4 billion children many by dedicated Rotarians during National Immunization Days. Rotary has prevented more than 19, oops, more than 19, more than 19 million cases of polio, avoiding 2 million deaths, and while raising $3 billion, we vaccinate um, more than 450 million children a year in developing countries. But until polio is eradicated, it is a world threat. And because there's no cure for polio, vaccination is the only protection. And here's the scary part. This is before COVID uh, with all the flights uh, in the world. This is a 24 hour period of flights. Each line is a uh, flight. You can hardly see North America and Europe. Uh, it's, it's very scary because we truly are a plane ride away from polio returning to the United States if polio is not er eradicated, especially if we don't keep up vaccination rates. 
and during the COVID-19 pandemic vaccination rates because parents are afraid to take their kids into the doctors, vaccination rates have plummeted. I pray that the eradication of polio happens soon so that all kids around the world will avoid what happened to many like myself when a vaccine was not available. So I'm often asked, what's the plus in Polio Plus? Over the next several months, the Polio Plus infrastructure Rotary helped build, including its tools, workforce, and extensive surveillance networks, will be used to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 by supporting preparedness and re uh, response activities in many countries, including Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. This truly represents the plus in Polio Plus, just as it did in the past to respond to outbreaks of Ebola, yellow fever, and avian flu. A prime example of that is the role Polio Plus played in stopping the Ebola uh, uh, outbreak twice in the past four years in Africa, especially in Nigeria, literally stopping Ebola from becoming a pandemic in, in uh, Africa. Recently, a letter from Polio Plus International Chair Michael McGovern and past Rotary International President John Germ outlined the role that Polio Plus is currently playing worldwide in the coronavirus pandemic. And these are some of the things that uh, they're converting the Polio Plus program and helping educate families and train health workers and uh, trace contacts and investigate cats, uh, cases, an incredible uh, outreach and will help Rotary's Polio Plus become uh, a lot more respected throughout the world in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, oops. Here we have a polio survivor in Nigeria who used to have to travel miles to get water for his herd. Polio Plus drilled boreholes in his village and now he gets clean water for his herd and his family without traveling miles, thus becoming much more productive. A few months ago in India, NID workers, National Immunization Day workers, and volunteers vaccinated more than 32 million children in one weekend. These immense NID vaccine campaigns are also changing societies in Muslim countries by employing women to go house to house vaccinating children. In the Muslim religion, a man cannot enter a home if the man of the house is not there. A woman can. Therefore, by employing women, to do the vaccinations, less children are skipped, and the number of women in the workforce are uh, increasing, thus changing the societal views of women working out of the uh, home. During NID, er in areas that uh, have malaria, mosquito nets are given out by polio plus workers. This polio, keep on doubling here, this polio survivor um, had no way of financially supporting himself until Polio Plus taught him how to make hand-driven bikes that allow polio survivors to get around without dragging themselves on the ground. He started a business making these tricycles. Here's one of his employees that now has a job and is a productive member of society, mostly because of Rotary's Polio Plus. While confronting the new challenges of today, uh, it's important that Rotary members continue to fight to end polio, to, uh, to sustain our commitment to the children of the world we made in 1985, and to reach our fundraising goal of $50 million this year, which with the Gates Foundation matching monies becomes $150 million. Continued contributions to Polio Plus will ensure that polio eradication activities that are ongoing, such as surveillance and vaccine supply, continue, and that we come out of this crisis strong and tackle the remaining barriers to a polio-free world. As I said, uh, I'm one of the lucky ones. If I was born in a developing country back in the 1950s, I wouldn't be here today. I've shared my personal story with polio, certainly not for your sympathy for my personal situation. Through the love of my family and friends and being fortunate to find knowledgeable doc doctors, I've been able to be a father, husband, son, friend, and now a proud Rotarian. And please remember that individual efforts and ideas started organizations like Rotary, Shelterbox, uh, Rise Against Hunger, Easter Seals, 
uh, and so many more great humanitarian efforts. CART is one of, an, another big uh, area uh, where individual efforts and ideas have proven to be so incredible. So never underestimate your individual efforts or ideas. As Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you about Polio and Polio Plus. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. John, are you aware if any uh, asymptomatic, uh, undiagnosed uh, people from the 50s are being diagnosed with uh, post-polio syndrome? Uh, actually, there there are. They're starting to put two and two together. A lot of times, post polio syndrome for people who had asymptomatic uh, polio, they they are having signs of post polio syndrome. But the problem is, is that many doctors, because they've not seen a polio patient and they don't put two and two together, especially if that person d didn't know they had polio, um, often they get diagnosed like I was with fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. Symptoms are very similar, but the problem is that the treatment is completely opposite. For fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, they want you to exercise and substantially increase your exercise and build muscle and things like that, which is so counterintuitive of, of what a polio survivor uh, needs. I have a number of, I'm on a couple of boards of polio survivor groups, and um, I have some really very good friends that, you know, went through most of their life not knowing they had had polio. And then, you know, one person in the family start talking about such and such a person had polio. And then, you know, uh, oh, well, you know, your, your cousin and they played together a lot and they put two and two together. And then they're, you know, they usually go to a, a neurologist that does uh, some EMGs on them and uh, which is very painful. They get a diagnosis of post polio syndrome and they're very shocked that they had had polio. John, this is Paul. Um, thank you for sharing your story. I think thank you. Um, I'm 31 years old and I feel oftentimes removed uh, you know, from polio, aside from being a Rotarian, and it gets me very excited to hear you, um, you know, not, not only tell your story, but tell what, what Rotary is doing and, and how, you know, as being a Rotarian, we're a part of that. My question for you is, w did you become a Rotarian knowing what Rotary does or had been doing with polio, or did you discover that after being, uh, becoming a Rotarian? Well, actually, I was, um, I was up in central New Jersey, near Trenton, New Jersey, and a neighbor knew I had had polio, and he was, he was a member of the local Rotary Club. Um, he asked me to come in and talk to his club about polio and post-polio syndrome. I sort of knew what Rotary did with polio, but I didn't know all the other things, and um, so, you know, I had an incredible experience uh, my first Rotary meeting. Uh, I actually came back the next week as a guest. And um, eventually after two meetings, uh, they asked me to join. And uh, I often get, because I've only been a member of Rotary for 10 years. And I often am asked, well, why didn't you become a Rotary Rotarian before that? I said, no one ever asked me. So, you know, that's a, that's a key thing is, you know, I mean, everyone has people in their lives that they know that are good people that do, you know, community service. And you really need to, you know, say, think about asking them because uh, I wish it was after I had retired from my business. I wish I had the four-way test in my, in, in my life when I had, had owned my business. I don't know if I would have made any different choices, uh, but it would have been nice to have the four-way test in my life when I owned a business. Thank you.